just prepared a presentation. Um, the first part, I just go through the general history of online poker dating back to its uh, early explosive growth in the early 2000s, bringing it all the way up to today. Um, and then I'm going to go into uh, the Virtue Poker platform and how we work and why we're different. Um, and then finally, I'm going to conclude with what we currently have active, which is an open beta and how you can participate and play to, to compete for some prizes. So with that said, um, I like to tell the story of online poker through a narrative um, of a hypothetical player called Joe Poker. So Joe Poker was born in Canada. He's now 35 years old. He unfortunately isn't very good. Uh, he generally loses when he plays online and he plays about five to six times per month. And he was active from the early 2000s up through 2015. So the real explosive growth came uh, beginning in 2003. Um, for those unfamiliar with the online poker space, uh, it was because a, a poker player named Chris Moneymaker, which is his actual legal name, believe it or not, won an entry to the World Series of Poker main event for a $10,000 seat by winning a satellite tournament uh, for, with an $86 buy-in. Um, and satellite events, by the way, are where people pay a small amount of fees um, to compete for a top prize that's usually an entry into a live event. So Chris Moneymaker takes his entry, goes to the World Series of Poker main event, and ends up winning the whole thing that was broadcasted live on ESPN and won $2.5 million. So it was a Cinderella story where pretty much it created an image where any person on the planet, rich or poor, could compete at the highest level and win a large amount of money. So with that said, it blew up the online poker space as well as the live poker scene. You can see the growth of the main event in terms of entries from 2003 to 2006 going up tenfold. So millions of people like Chris Moneymaker or like Joe Poker decide to create online accounts and play online and deposit on these sites. So there were very few offerings at the time. Uh, the biggest were Party Poker, Poker Stars, Full Tilt, among others. And what happened was essentially these sites became the central banks of online poker. You had all of these players deposit mil millions of dollars of their own money onto these sites, and there was relatively no regulatory oversight. And all of these players were happy to send and trust these sites with their money because they wanted a shot to win it big. So unfortunately, that Lack of oversight led to a series of scandals in the online poker space, um, one of which was the full tilt Ponzi scheme. So the way that this happened was the United States didn't like all of this unregulated gambling happening on their, on their, in their country, so they passed the Unlawful Internet Gaming Enforcement Act, which essentially made it illegal to process payments in relation to gambling activity. Half the sites, excuse me while I pause my slack, which is... <laughs> constantly bugging me, apologize guys. Um, hold that thought, there we go. Okay, so essentially what happened was most of these sites, um, half the sites continued to operate within the US borders, but they largely went untouched for several years in 2011 when the Department of Justice, in 2007, excuse me, when the Department of Justice uh, on a day called, 2011, excuse me, on a day called Black Friday, seized the domains of uh, Poker Stars, Absolute Poker, and Full Tilt. When they seized their domains and did investigations into these companies, they realized that Full Tilt had a $350 million shortfall. Uh, so essentially what they were doing were they, they were taking, they were commingling player deposits with operational funds. So your deposit onto their site, they were taking and using to pay for our operational expenses. So this left millions of players without uh, any type of process to get their money off the site. Uh, another famous scandal was with Absolute Poker. So what happened was essentially the players themselves determined that one player was winning at a rate of 14 standard deviations above the mean, uh, which was a win rate that's impossible. And they continually reported this to the site and their complaints went unnoticed until finally it got a decent amount of press and it was revealed that a company insider had gained access to a master account where they were able to view all of the players' cards on the platform. So this player along with his co-conspirators was able to steal millions of dollars of players on these funds, uh, worth of funds. All this is to say that the centralized architecture where a single operator controls all of the player funds, has all the account information, and has all the game logic, is in a very strong structure going forward. 
Another problem with online poker was the rise of third-party software and bots. So heads-up displays are essentially third-party tools that can plug into these poker platforms that show you the players playing stats and their opponents. So the better players, usually the semi-professionals or professionals, were giving themselves even more of an additional edge over the recreational players. So a practice is called bum hunting, where essentially the, these very good players would target the recreational players and take all of their money. So through all of this, what happened in the online poker space was recreational players left the market. They stopped depositing online, which is bad for the poker economy because you need recreational players to continually deposit to fund the players who continually win and are net withdrawler, withdrawlers. So this created a strain on the growth of the online poker space. So what's the problem? How can we get the Joe Pokers of the world back? Well, recreational players don't trust online poker. They don't trust the centralized storage of player deposits. And there's still a prevalence among many players that the game is rigged. So that because of the centralized RNG architecture. And when you think about it in a live casino, you can see the dealer, you can see how the deck is shuffled. There really isn't a trust issue with how the, how the cards are being dealt. In the online space, there isn't that same level of transparency. And then, of course, these unfair third-party tools tilted the odds in such a way that it really made it impossible for recreational players to have fun playing online. They would lose their money too quickly. Bringing this up to today, also, live gaming is on pause. So the World Series of Poker, European Poker Tour, and all other major tournament circuits have been canceled, essentially, for the rest of the year. And Vegas, where John is from, and Macau uh, are closed. Uh, this is a picture from Vegas. It looks like a ghost town. And then on the picture on the right is some of the casino's attempts to create a environment that people would feel safe in given the COVID-19 outbreak. All this is to say that not only are the players fearful, but the dealers and other staff are fearful of, fearful of going back into these casinos with thousands of other people. So even if live poker operations resumed, it's doubtful that people would be as willing to play. With that said, online gambling is surging. So recent figures provided by Game Intel indicates a five-year high in online poker with more than 45,000 concurrent players at the end of March, a 50% surge on the previous month. As you can see from the chart, we're going back five years in time in terms of the usage of online poker. There's a resurgence in the market. All that's to say is I think it's ready for a new entrant into the space, which is us. So who are we? What is Virtue Poker? So uh, Virtue Poker is a consensus incubated company. Um, I began the, the project um, along with Joe at Consensus way back in uh, 2015. Um, and we've built out over the last few years a blockchain-based peer-to-peer system uh, that aims to create more trust and transparency in the online poker world. So the way that we do that is we employ a peer-to-peer -peer shuffling protocol where every player is involved in shuffling for every single hand on the platform. There's no centralized RNG or server involved in the process. We use a combination of mainnet Ethereum contracts and a virtue poker sidechain to create a transparent payment rail. So players always know how their money is, being flow is flowing through the platform. And within the application itself, we use a combination of player application wallets where you are in control of your funds and virtue poker based sidechain smart contracts that are used to escrow your buy-ins for each individual game that you play on the platform and our goal is to create a framework that dormant player recreational players like joe poker can trust so what is our vision for the future we want to remove player deposit risk solve the trust issue with regards to gameplay and create a fair and balanced poker network where recreational players aren't bum hunted uh with record uh by semi-professional and professional players. So how does our payment system work? So the way that it works is every single player has a mainnet Ethereum wallet, which we call their source of funds. They deposit by sending some Ether or R token BPP to a mainnet smart contract, which is then routed across a bridge to our Virtue Poker sidechain and we mint the equivalent amount of tokens in the sidechain, and that's deposited in your application wallet. Each individual table is represented by a unique smart contract with the custom game, par game parameters. So depending on the buy-in level, the game type, the blinds, et cetera, um, is customizable by game within our sidechain. And for the first time, by using this type of system, we can provide transparency, transparency into how player funds are being managed and players know their money is secure. 
So this is just to highlight the how, uh, how individual gameplay works. So you fund your own wallet with Ether VPP, you send your buy into smart contracts on the Virtue Poker sidechain, and they hold them in escrow while the game is being played. And the contract automatically distributes the payouts based on the game outcomes. So within this system, you always have control of your funds. It's never deposited or held in trust by us. So one of the cool things that we plan on launching with this um, is multi-token wagering. So we don't want to force users to have to just wager an R token or ETH. We think that there's um, going to be significant interest in being able to wager in other tokens or stable tokens, for example, if you don't want the exposure to the volatility risk. So using our infrastructure, we can deploy various contracts with different tokens and create different side chains depending upon the token that we're allowing enabling wagering. So that you can wager in Ether, you can wager in DAI, you can wager in our token BPP. Um, and depending upon interest in other potential tokens and projects, we could add those that functionality well uh, as well. It's a very flexible infrastructure, so we're going to we're able to deploy these relatively easily. Currently, right now, we have the ability for people to wager in Ether and BPP. So uh, I think this is one of the most interesting things about Virtue Poker. So it's the way that we do the shuffling. So it's called Mental Poker. It's an encryption scheme that was published in the late 70s and early 80s. And it was so trying to address the problem of how can multiple players play a game of poker online without having to trust a single source. And the way it works is every single person's computer is linked up and every single player is involved in shuffling and encrypting the deck. And I'm just going to go through how that works. So we have three players, Bob, Alice, and Joe. And Bob is the dealer. So he starts with a deck of cards, a virtual deck on his computer. It's 52 cards. He shuffles them on his computer. No one else can see it. He then encrypts the deck with the same key on each card. He then passes the deck to Alice, who does the same thing, shuffles the deck, and encrypts the deck. Alice then passes the deck to Joe, who does the same thing, shuffles the deck, and encrypts the deck. So the deck is now in its final, final ordered state, right? You can think of this as cards ordered 1 through 52. And Joe, uh, Bob is, now has this deck, and he cannot see the cards. He removes the initial encryption key that he put on every single card and replaces it by indexing the deck with a unique encryption key on each card. As you can see here, think of it as B1, B2, B3, all the way to B52. Alice... He then passes the deck to Alice, who does the same thing. Encrypts the deck with a unique key for each card, passes it to Joe, who does the same thing. So as you can see here, when it's in its final state, every card is individually encrypted by each player at the table. While players need to see their whole cards, some cards are private, some cards are public. So the way that that happens is players share keys amongst each other. So Alice and Joe share the keys that correspond to Joe's cards and vice versa. So Joe can, so Bob can see his cards and no one else. Joe can see his cards and no one else. And uh, Alice can do the same. For the community cards, all players share keys that correspond to those cards so that all players can view them. And this process continues until the end of the hand. So that's mental poker. So where we came from and where are we going? So as I mentioned, we've been around since 2015. Uh, the company really matured after we completed our token sale back in May of 2018. Uh, we completed, we sold 100 million BPP tokens for 25,000 Ether. And we essentially leveraged our token buyers as uh, an initial base of alpha players. So we released our alpha a month later and we were in a private alpha for about a year. We partnered with some of the world's most famous pros over the course of that time, including Brian Rast, Phil Ivey, and Dan Coleman. And we launched a private beta in May of 2019, a year later, with 2,000 players. We had about half a million hands played. And then we launched an open beta in November of 2019. And we currently have over 4,000 players. We've had over 2 million hands played since the launch of the open beta. And in terms of the regulatory path, we chose to go um, by, with the path of being a regulated site. So. Uh, over a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, we've been working with the Malta Gaming Authority and are going to be the first and only blockchain-based poker platform to be licensed under their new decentralized ledger technology legislation. So we'll be able to access, I would say, greater than 70% of the world's markets via our single uh, Maltese gaming license. And unfortunately, for the, if there's any Americans on the call, we won't be launching in the U.S. for real money um, for day one. 
Um, however, that is to say, it is, it is a, from what we've seen in the space, most of the other plot projects that have tried to tackle blockchain-based gambling have gone the unregulated path. And we really don't see that as a legally viable strategy. Um, essentially, uh, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't approach. So damned if you don't in terms of if you don't acquire players, no one cares and you fail. If you do acquire players and a lot of players, then you're going to get the attention of regulators and and uh, you know other countries, departments of justice around the world who can go after you. And it's not like being in the cryptocurrency space absolves you from the law. Um, one of the uh, more prominent companies to be indicted by the Department of Justice Seals with Clubs, which was based uh, in Vegas, where John is, um, was shut down after they enabled Bitcoin wagering without a gaming license. And it was because the platform began taking off, right? So they don't come after you until you start getting users. So with that said, I believe Virtue Poker is at the nexus of the resurgence in online gaming due to the post-COVID-19 paradigm and the maturation of blockchain technology as a production-ready payment infrastructure and is the only current company with a legally viable long-term strategy to capture market share. It makes it more difficult because we have to go through this licensing process, which is like pulling teeth, but Luckily, we won't have to look over our shoulder and can continue to grow, seek external investment if needed, grow as, in, as a mature company as we continue to launch the product and go forward. So for the five people and John on the call, I would love for you guys to join our beta. It's free to play. It's a desktop only client available on Windows, Mac and Linux. Uh, we have a bunch of active promotions running. Um, so we give out Ether daily. Uh, we run these bust to host events where if you bust a member of the Virtue Poker staff in a sit and go tournament, you win 0.2 Ether. We do a one Ether weekly drawing if you play a thousand hands on the platform. Uh, and we run a bankroll builder promotion. So right now our token is currently locked. It's not trading. Our plan is to release the token and enable trading upon our mainnet launch, which right now is targeted for midsummer. And meanwhile, while you compete in the beta, the more you play, the more VP, real VPP tokens you earn that will deposit directly in your account so that you can become a real money customer from day one on our site. Uh, we're giving away a World Series of Poker main event entry. So main event is not going to happen in July like usual, but we still are going to give away an entry. Um, so we run a leaderboard promotion and based on your performance and these sit and goes on the app, uh, you get points and if you rank in the top you see uh, the top three you'll get a, a seat at a final table where you compete with the top prize as a main event entry and we're also running our ivy's table promotion so right now uh ivy is playing really well in a new game format called short deck poker which is a 36 card variant of texas hold'em uh, where the cards two three four and five are removed from the deck and there's a few little rule changes like an ace can be used for the bottom end of a straight and a flush actually beats a full house. Um, long story short, uh, if you download the app, compete and play on Virtue Poker and uh, place in the top three of our leaderboard, you automatically get a seat at a final table to play against Ivy himself with the top prize being $5,000. And if you knock out uh, Phil Ivy and you win, you get an extra 2,000 so you can win up to $7,000 in cash. And as I mentioned earlier, you can build a real money bankroll that you can unlock when Virtue goes to mainnet. Um, so yeah, so how to get involved, you can download the app at virtue.poker, make sure you're on your desktop, uh, join our community on Twitter or Telegram, Medium banned us, so well, our blog has moved to Ghost, and uh, I hate Medium now uh, for their, their censorship, but anyway, and if you have any business inquiries or questions, you can contact me at ryan at virtue.poker. Uh, and that is it. So in terms of, oh yes, yeah, so one other thing, um, for those on the call, I'm not sure if any of you guys are currently players, um, but I'll just show you generally how what the app looks like. So this is the app. Uh, we've wrapped Phil's branding around everything um, since it's our big promotion that we're running right now. Um, I've already registered an account, so I'm just gonna show you the lobby UI. So when you download the app, uh, we automatically, we're on testnet right now, so we automatically download, uh, download we automatically um, distribute 50,000 test VPP tokens to your um, wallet in the app. 
So then you use those VPP to compete for prizes. As you can see, I've been doing pretty well. I've actually run up my bankroll up to 60, almost 65,000 VPP. Um, and right now we only have single table uh, tournaments and uh, catch game tables. Most of the promotions right now are centered around sit and go. Um, so we have uh, turbos, uh, a turbo variant for Hold'em, Short Deck, and Omaha. And we have a regular version for uh, sit and go for Hold'em. And we also offer three different types of cash tables. We have two different views. If you, this is what we initially launched with, which we call the quick seat view. Um, but some of the feedback from our players was that they preferred the traditional um, list format for the lobby. So we went with that. Um, and this is our cashier. So right now you don't have to do anything. You don't have to deposit or withdrawal or you know, interact with the cashier at the moment. Um, but the way that it will look when you go live on mainnet is you have a source of funds. So this is your mainnet Ethereum wallet. Oops, right here, sorry. Um, and you can deposit either VPPs or Ether. Um, this is on rank B right now. Uh, no, I wish I had 17 Ether right now in my source of funds wallet. But <laughs> and uh, so yeah, so this is uh, uh, the way that you deposit on the app when we go live. We're going to rework this to make it more user friendly. Um, as I'm sure anyone on this call is aware, onboarding is a challenge um, within the app, within the uh, decentralized application space. Um, so we plan on trying to make it as easy as possible to sign up, create a wallet if you don't already have one. Um, and be able to wager and play on the site without actually first owning any cryptocurrency. So we're going to be launching with the Spank World Builder promo, as well as with deposit bonuses for registering an account, things like that to make it easy to acquire players. Um, and with that said, I think that's all I got in terms of presentation. Um, great. Uh, thanks so much for giving us the info, all the great info on Virtue Poker. Um, I play myself on the site. It's fantastic user experience. Um, I just a quick question. I, I would love to know how did you a get into poker and and crypto? Did it did were they uh, in relation to each other? Or were they completely separate? And I guess I'll follow up with why I asked that question after after you. Yeah. So in terms of um, my interest in poker, I've always I've been playing online poker and live poker. Well, online since I was sixteen. Um, and prepaid debit cards, which a lot of us did as Americans back in the day. Um, and I began playing live poker as soon as I turned 18 and, um, and could go to one of the casinos uh, on the Indian reservations, which had 18 plus instead of 21 plus. So I've always been a big poker fan. Um, but the specific in intersection of blockchain-based poker um, came from you know, me joining Consensus. I joined Consensus in October of 2015. Um, this was just after Ethereum launched and we were, as a company, very small. I mean, we were maybe 30, 40 people. And um, essentially we were trying to find use cases um, for this technology in industries where trust, transparency, and more efficient payment system were valuable. And uh, online poker seemed to be a great fit. Um, so soon after I joined Consensus, I was I did a bunch of market research into um, if it was a viable strategy to try to start a company in this space. And meanwhile, Joe had a developer named Jim Barry working on building out a prototype of a peer-to-peer blockchain-based poker app. So based on the research I put together, I did think that there was a good opportunity here. And um, over the next 18 months, it was just the two of us working on building a prototype, building a business model, uh, trying to figure out how to make it legally viable. Uh, and, you know, over time, it became clear that gambling was going to be one of the first verticals where blockchain based apps would get some traction. Um, because we have the adoption issue of people who don't already own cryptocurrency will have a tough time interacting with dApps. Now, ever, you know, since, you know, fast forward four years later, we have things like MoonPay and other onboarding tools making it a little bit easier, but it's still that fundamental problem of if there isn't already interested, uh, interest within a particular community of consumers, you're going to have trouble getting players. And luckily for us, um, Bitcoin uh, and Ether became uh, a really significant point of entrance among the poker community long before I even went out to try to bring on some marquee name pros 
poker players themselves were discovering that using cryptocurrency was an efficient way to deposit and withdraw from sites. People within the poker community were, were posting about you know, their, their thesis on whether or not Bitcoin will work. So there was already that overlap. So that, to me, was a big confirmation that we should continue to push forward, which we did. Fantastic. Yeah, I remember uh, I moved to Vegas about three, three and a half years ago. And uh, in the 2017, 2018 run up, the, the crypto bull run, I remember there'd be players of, you know, very notable players with treasures around their neck on a lanyard because of, you know, just how much sheer value they, they had on that. And, uh, you know, I think the poker economy gets the, the peer-to-peer aspect really well. And of course, the tokenization angle of that we're all used to in a live setting, you know, we exchange fiat for a, a token essentially in a casino that we know um, has value in, in that domain. And, um, you know, there's things like lending throughout the, the poker community, both, you know, on the good side and the bad side, or uh, good stories and bad stories of the lending. But um, no, it's fascinating. And, you know, just personally, I remember when uh, the, you know, Black Friday happened and the Department of Justice shut it all down and the sites like Seals with Clubs popped up. Um, where, you know, you could basically buy Bitcoin and, and you could be able to play online poker again, which was a workaround. And then to your point, you know, once they had all those eyeballs uh, kind of fixated on them and their, their traffic, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the, the big, fi- big fish eats little fish scenario. But um, this, was, uh, this has been fantastic. I opened up the chat uh, to the attendees that you guys can chat me uh, directly any questions you have. Um, the only reason I'm not, uh, opening up everyone's mic is just because we don't, we don't want any nefarious things being said. So, um, Ryan, any other additional comments or, um, just maybe a, a macro outlook on the online poker, um, kind of environment? That might be headed? Yeah. So I think, you know, an interesting thing, um, to kind of get a look behind the scenes. So I know I brought up the regulation front. So, the problem, a big problem with online poker that I didn't bring up was like a very globally fragmented structure was created where individual countries were requiring companies to get licenses and operate uh, a separate skin of their site only within their borders and things like that. So that problem still persists. Um, so you have, for example, um, the UK has a point of consumption uh, uh, legislation where you have to get a separate license specifically for UK players and pay separate tax just for the revenue you generate from UK players. There's a fenced in market within the EU for Spain and Italy, um, where those two countries share liquidity, but with no one else. So that, unfortunately, you know, one of the initial visions for Virgin Poker was to try to get around all that. The legal reality was that that wasn't going to be the case, that we would survive for a while. And then until we got the attention and eyeballs that, we, would, we wouldn't be able to survive. And with that said, even now, m- many countries, you know, particularly even the UK, um, are very um, against the idea of blockchain-based gambling and cryptocurrency, use of cryptocurrency for wagering. So the strategy with us is we're using the Malta setting as a, as a test lab to try to show the viability, the desirability, and a actual live operation where nothing bad happens to show it is hard for the industry so that more countries would be open to licensing and allowing companies like ours to operate within their borders. So I think that's an interesting thing. And in terms of the industry itself, every year more and more countries create their own specific um, licensing regimes. Back in the day, in the early 2000s, it was just Malta, Gibraltar, Gibraltar, Isle of Man, and then the UK created their own licensing regime, and then there's been a waterfall effect where everyone's gone that way. So the regulated path is the future, which, you know, take it with a grain of salt. The good news is you won't have, you'll be able to um, not have sites run off, hopefully, with your money um, provided, and especially with sites like ours. But in addition, you know, I think it's a viable strategy to go this path. And also, I think, you know, it, it substantiates the industry as a whole if you can get a major regulator to sign off on uh, using this technology in, in, a, in a company and in, in, in gaming. Um, and then in terms of just the other general outlook, 
Um, one of the things in some of the conversations I've had is I think we're going to be moving towards an online first future. So things like this, where we have virtual conferences, we have uh, more online events, more online commerce is going to be a trend that's going to stay long term, at least for the foreseeable future. So I think in terms of the, the market for online gambling is only going to grow over the next few years. So there's a good amount of opportunity um, and there's very little brand loyalty. No one, no one loves poker stars or loves 888 or loves party poker, right? They play there because they have to and they don't have any other options. So it's definitely a difficult path, but there is a path, I think, there where, you know, this could potentially become more of a mainstream adoption tool um, for the space. And with that said, I also think, it, you know, gambling is going to be the first consumer sector within um, uh, that will have that will see more widespread adoption. Right now, it's DeFi and exchanges and games. And gambling, I think, is you know next in line to really see start seeing some uh, some growth. I think that's um, I think that's all I got. No, that was great. Um, and then maybe we could just end on. So you brought up um, uh, the game of short deck uh, hold'em and um, Ivy, you know, exceeding very well at it. Um, I, I would love to know just kind of uh, your thoughts, A, about uh, the game of short deck and, and your feelings about it and, um, you know, what we know about it thus far. I mean, you know, Macau has owned the, the highest stakes in the world for, you know, let's say maybe the last 10 years in ultra-exclusive private, semi-private games. Um, and then this game, from what we know, has um, kind of been extracted out of that scene, given some of those whales or, or you know, the biggest players in the world um, not liking two through six in the deck. So um, just would love your thoughts on, on short deck and then I guess just kind of the momentum and excitement behind it. Yeah, so I, I the funny thing is, so when I first brought on Ivy um, in November of 2017, so it's almost three years ago, um, the reason why we put it in our alpha, you know, two, over two years ago, because when I was there, the only thing he was playing was short deck. And I was like, what is this game? And he described it to me. And the reason why it's a really cool game is uh, you make hands much more often. So there's much more action. So it's like PLO in the sense where you play your draws, you make hands like, you know, uh, far more often. And also it hasn't been solved yet. It'll probably get solved soon, like every other game. But it's a bit of a, you know, an exciting um, branch into the wild, wild west where, you know, you can yourself work hard to try to figure out how to play the game correctly so that there's that opportunity again, that gap of time where if you become an expert and you play against people who haven't put in the work, you'll be able to beat them consistently over time. Um, so I think you, you know, you get the, the excitement and the action of Pot Limit Omaha, um, but there is a bit more more fine-tuned strategy involved and it's not as foreign where uh where you have four cards at least you still have two cards in your hand so people who know texas hold'em can pick up the game quickly i think it'll take people a little bit longer to learn um and in terms of you know the future for the game uh, i've already started seeing many of the major poker circuits start adding short deck um so party poker just ran one uh, Triton has one. The main event uh, in the World Series actually had a short deck event last year. So uh, that's usually a good sign that the game is here to stay. Um, and the reason we structured the promo that we have currently around that game type is partially, we had noticed that 90% of our traffic was playing No Limit Hold'em, which is to be expected. And it was trying to really force people to try to take a look at this game to see if they enjoy it. And the feedback so far has been pretty positive people have enjoyed the playing on, on our site and playing that game. So, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, any, any new variation of Hold'em or, um, you know, uh, more of an action Hold'em um, game is, is definitely not bad for, for poker at all. Um, and then just last question, maybe we can wrap up a few minutes early here. Um, you know, there's two camps of poker players these days, these days, I would say both on the live setting and online, you know, we have the, the GTO game theory, optimal um, diehards, as well as the field players, someone like that comes to mind, like a Bryn Kenny, that's just, you know, ex you know, extremely talented and has crushed it for, for so long, but claims that he 
sits outside that that GTO realm and isn't running solvers and things like that. Uh, just would love your feedback. Uh, maybe not to put you on the spot, but maybe uh, what what camp are you in, and and uh, do you think it's good or bad for the game that um, that maybe it's leaning more towards that that solver approach these days? Yeah, I'm in the fir- I'm the field camp. I've always played that way. It's, uh, maybe it's why I haven't won as much money as some of these other guys, but. Um, in terms of where, it, you know, one of the things that you always hear uh, when you're sitting at live games is the personal and kind of like entertainment component. And even if you are playing to make some money, um, that gets abstracted out when it becomes too, too robotic, where it's, you know, there isn't, there isn't, there isn't choice, right? It's like your deterministic nature is taken from you. Uh, uh, it's a deterministic game, right? When you, when you have all of these solvers, every single decision is made for you in advance. And I think that takes away some of the fun of the game. Now, is that a strategy that's here to stay? Absolutely. I mean, you're not going to get people off of that, right? Because they'll, that you create an edge for yourself when other people make mistakes. Um, and is it bad for the game? I think it, it is. I think the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room is that these AI bots that are getting produced by some of these universities are beating pro players now. Um, and initially it was just in heads up, so you could kind of breathe a sigh of relief, but now it started, start, they're starting to beat players in multiplayer games. The prevalence of having that type of computing power it's not widespread like you're not gonna have like someone run uh, a super machine bot on poker stars right now but you know as as other kind of trends of technology go it's probably a matter of time so that's where really what happens with the online poker sites it's a chicken and mouse get, or cat and mouse that's the phrase I'm looking for sorry cat and mouse game where as these people who are able to employ these bots get smarter, there's new strategies to combat them. Then the people who are running the bots figure out those strategies and build their bots around it. So you're never going to get ahead of it. And the only thing you can do as an operator is continue to refine your game security strategies and how to prove that it is people playing and not bots. But it is going to be a problem that will never go away in online poker. And that's why live poker, you know, I think it will, will always be here to stay. It's just not going to be here for the next at least a year. So unfortunately, but you know, I think it'll be bad for the game if poker becomes chess, right? Where chess is just solved by, by machines. So that human component of it is what makes it fun. Um, so, you know, my hope is that it's able to survive long term. but you know, there is, there is that, that, kind of aura around online poker that will constantly exist with people being concerned about it. Absolutely. No, I totally agree with you. I'm, I'm in the field camp as well. Um, you know, I, I wish uh, live poker to be back sooner than ever, as well as everything else that we love to do in this world. Um, guys, thanks so much for joining. Uh, just to everyone in the chat, please go over to, I uh, dropped the link in the chat, uh, virtue.poker. Um, test out the site, come play with me, Ryan, and, and many others that are battling in there. Um, and uh, there's some great promos as well. But Ryan, sincerely enjoyed the chat, man. Uh, we report this, so we'll have a recording over to you if you'd like to use it in any capacity. And uh, looking forward to doing a podcast, hopefully, in the future with you. 100%. Let's do it. Thanks, guys. You got it. Bye, everyone.